I think the thing that fascinates us all, um, and I found when I was writing the book, is that Churchill actually forged a very, very close relationship with Canada over a 50-year period. Um, and that tends to be overshadowed by, of course, that special relationship that he had with Roosevelt in America. But actually, his relationship was um, just as close with Canada. And indeed, Churchill came to Canada for the first time uh, in 1900 when he was lecturing, doing a lecturing tour about his adventures in the Boer War. And he came to Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto, Winnipeg. Um, and it was almost 30 years before he came again in 1929, which of course is that famous year of the Wall Street crash and the great economic crisis that engulfed the world. And he was on a three month speaking tour and he came to America and Canada again. Uh, amongst the cities he visited, Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, uh, and that city just to the south of us here, I think, but I'm not allowed to mention. Uh, <laughs> and he was back in Toronto and Ottawa in 1932, so he was a regular visitor. And then, of course, fatefully, he was back here in December 1941, after the Japanese launched that surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, and he very quickly crossed the Atlantic to consult with Roosevelt and Mackenzie King um, on Allied strategy. Might have been turned up on Allied strategy. And the great thing, of course, about that visit in 1941 um, is that while he was in Ottawa, he had a certain photograph taken, didn't he? Yusef Karsh, the photographer, uh, took that iconic black and white photograph of Churchill, which is what we all now know uh, epitomises that sort of bulldog defiance that he exhibited during the war. Uh, and I'm sure many of you in the audience know the story behind that uh, photograph. For those of you who don't, Churchill liked to be photographed with a cigar in his hand. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen many photographs of him over the years, and he tended to use cigars as a prop. There's always something in his hand. And Karsh decided that he wanted a portrait of the British Prime Minister minus his cigar. So what he did was he leant forward and snatched it out of Churchill's hands, then took the photograph. So that look of belligerence actually was as a result of him losing his cigar, not the fact that he was looking defiant about confronting Nazi Germany. <laughs> And of course he was back in Canada again in 1943 and 44 for the two Quebec conferences when the Allied leaders once more got together to decide strategy and what they were going to do at the end of the war. And it was while he was here his premiership almost ended because Colonel Clark in 1943 when he was here for the first conference invited him to go trout fishing for the very first time. And again I'm sure some of you may have seen that photograph of Churchill precariously balanced in the front of a canoe, standing, having just cast off while he was trout fishing. Now you imagine if he toppled overboard into that Canadian lake, um, heaven forbid what happened, because someone rather unkindly described Churchill swimming as that of a wallowing hippopotamus. And Churchill himself always described himself as an enthusiastic paddler. He was not a good swimmer. Luckily, he survived that fishing trip and he lived to carry on leading Britain during the Second World War. During the Second World War, if you include Newfoundland, which I appreciate didn't become part of Canada until 1949, he actually visited Canada four times compared to America three times. And of course he was back again in 1952 and 54 during his second premiership. What though is it that uh, we admire most about Churchill apart from his obvious achievements? General Eisenhower said we all think back to Sir Winston Churchill as a man who bespoke confidence. And I think that's what we all like about the man, his sense of self-assurance. Thank you.
Now, Churchill was a controversial figure, there's no denying that, but it's important to remember that he was controversial throughout his entire life. In his day, he was considered self-seeking and politically unpredictable. Um, and I think you'll all agree that he was a bit of his own spin doctor. Because, of course, famously, he started life as a Conservative MP, crossed the floor to the Liberals and crossed back again to the Conservatives, which is why many in the Tory party in 1940 thought he was not a good fit for being Prime Minister. And his reputation's always being re-evalued. Um, but while everyone may not agree with his politics, his uh, achievements are quite phenomenal. I like to think I've done quite a lot in my lifetime, but when you look at what Churchill achieved, he was a soldier, a war correspondent, a journalist, a writer, a novelist, a politician, a painter, and of course famously a bricklayer. And he crammed that all into his life. But what is it that um, inspires us most about his leadership? Foremost, I think it's his incredible zest for life and his risk-taking. Uh, to the extent he almost had a death wish. He almost got himself killed in Cuba, India, Sudan, South Africa, in France on the Western Front, and again in France and Normandy, and in Germany towards the end of the Second World War and the Rhine. But it's important to remember that Churchill's military outlook was forged on the battlefields of the British Empire. And all these experiences helped him for high office because he held nearly every single high office in Britain. He was Home Secretary, Colonial Secretary, First Lord of the Admiralty, twice, uh, Minister for Munitions, Secretary of State for War, Secretary of State for Air, and of course, finally, Prime Min Joint Prime Minister and Defence Minister. And his lifelong escapades, well, they mark him out as an adrenaline junkie, I think, as a danger seeker. And I think if he lived today, he'd be the sort of man uh, that would do extreme sports, bungee jumping, paragliding, anything to get his adrenaline pumping. And his numerous scrapes uh, with death convinced him, I think, that he was invincible and that nothing in life is gained without risk taking. He survived being under fire in Cuba on his 21st birthday. He had no business being there. Uh, his regiment, the 4th Hussars, were about to be shipped off to India uh, on an overseas deployment in an area of India where there wasn't any chance of action. So Churchill and a friend of his managed to get themselves off to Cuba to have a look at the Cuban War. Uh, his mother, as usual, pulled a few strings, wrote to the ambassador in Spain because, of course, at that time, Cuba was run by the Spanish, got authorization from Madrid, uh, and off he went. Um, and subsequently, when he got back, uh, wrote a number of articles and got himself in all sorts of trouble. But on his 21st birthday, as I say, while he was out there, he came under fire. Similarly, uh, when he got to India, he was bored, so managed to get himself attached to the Malakan Field Force and hightailed it off under his own steam uh, to the northwest frontier, which today we know as Pakistan. Uh, and while he was there, he very, very deliberately exposed himself to enemy fire. And the reason he did that, he was dead set on winning a gallantry award because he wanted to follow in his father's footsteps and become a politician. And he convinced himself that if he was a decorated veteran, it would help his political campaign. Um, so he put himself at great risk. He came to no harm, but a close friend of his on the northwest frontier was captured by the Patans, the tribesmen on the northwest frontier, and the man was hacked to death. And when they retrieved his body, it was a show, sobering message to Churchill when he saw what had happened to him. But Churchill didn't moderate his behaviour. No, because he then got himself packed off to the Sudan, where he very famously took part in that cavalry charge with the 21st Lancers. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that escapade. Uh, they saw a number of enemy's troops, dervishes, on the edge of a dry riverbank, launched a charge where they got to the edge of the riverbank and they peered down beneath. There were two to three thousand enemy troops. And it was only the momentum of their charge that actually carried them all the way through, well, carried most of them, I should say, carried them through the dervishes. Amongst them, of course, was Churchill, who survived. But that, fa that story is quite famous. What I find quite amusing is he almost never got to the battle because he was late getting to Egypt. By the time he arrived in Cairo, Kitchen's army had long gone south. So Churchill had to make his way south largely under his own steam. And memorably, 
He was traveling a while on his own and for two nights got lost in the desert. So he could have easily died of dehydration before he even got to Kitchener. As, as many of you I'm sure are aware, his brushes with death during the Boer War are legendary. He survived a crane crash after which he was captured, he subsequently escaped, and he then joined uh, a South African light cavalry regiment. They were nicknamed the Sakabulas because they wore these very prominent feathers in their hats. There was a slight problem with that feather in that it was a very attractive lure to Boer snipers. And at the Battle of Spion Kop, Churchill managed to get that feather shot off meaning the round had missed his skull by about six inches. Again at Hussar Hill, his brother Jack had joined the regiment. Churchill had managed to get him enrolled. Poor Jack, it was his first taste of combat, was immediately wounded and shipped back off to Britain. Uh, Churchill, not a scratch. Uh, another engagement in South Africa at Dewipsdorp. Churchill came off his horse and was about to be overridden by the Boers when by good fortune, one of his comrades rode to his rescue and carried him to safety. His behaviour, his risk-taking, continued on the Western Front. After the fiasco of Gallipoli and he was politically shamed, he resigned from government, became a battalion commander and marched off to war in France. And while he was there, he very famously would never take cover whenever he was shot at. And one day one of his men said to him, well, why do you do that? And he said, well, by the time you've heard the crack of the round, it means it's gone by you and there's absolutely no point in dropping to the ground. <laughs> he famously was incredibly brave and led quite a few patrols out into no man. His troops hated doing it because he had a nasty habit of blundering around like an elephant making huge amounts of noise and attracting the Germans. On another occasion, he was very memorably almost killed by enemy, uh, sorry, not enemy, by friendly fire. He'd befriended the local general who commanded the divisional artillery, and the pair of them had packed themselves off to a forward trench to watch a bombardment of the German lines. Unfortunately, the gunner's rounds dropped short, began to land in the trench behind them and not in the enemy trenches in front of them. There was a quick, frantic phone call. The gunners adjusted their uh, range, uh, and all was good. Once more, Churchill survived. On another occasion at his Ford headquarters in a farmhouse, he almost lost his right hand. He was sat in his headquarters with his staff when the Germans began to shell the farmhouse and shrapnel began to rain through the roof. By good fortune, Churchill just happened to be tinkering with his trench lamp, and they were quite large objects in those days. It was in his hand, a piece of shrapnel came through the roof and embedded itself in the trench lamp, narrowly missing his wrist. You kind of think all this might have moderated his behaviour and his risk-taking. None of it. Even at the ripe old age of 65, when he became Prime Minister, during the Second World War, he exposed himself to risk constantly. Of course, by 1940, early 1940, May 1940, Britain and France were struggling. And so Churchill indulged in what we would call today shuttle diplomacy, and he kept flying across the Channel to see French politicians to try and galvanise them into resisting the Nazi blitzkrieg. And he was returning from one of those trips when the pilot of his transport plane informed him he'd spotted two German Messerschmitt fighters. And it looked almost as if the British Prime Minister was about to be shot down over the English Channel within a matter of days of him having been appointed Prime Minister. Now, by good fortune, now unfortunately, there happened to be a hapless British trawler down in the waters of the English Channel. The Messerschmitt pilot spotted that and instead shot that up and Churchill was able to go merrily on his way, reached over in safety. 1944, and Churchill was a dead set on taking part, the 79th uh, anniversary was yesterday, of course, 6th of June, he was dead set on taking part in D-Day. And he and the King, like a pair of schoolboys, concocted this plan that they would get themselves onto a British destroyer, join the invasion fleet, take part in the bombardment, and watch the landings very closely. It was quickly pointed out that the sovereign and the political leader of Britain on the same vessel was not a good idea, and the King was prevailed upon not to go. When it was suggested Churchill was not to go, he huffed and puffed and refused to 
to stand down. So pressure was brought to bear on the king, and the king politely said to him, it's I did. the British Prime Minister takes part in the invasion. So out of respect for the king, Churchill didn't go. But within a matter of days of those landings, Churchill, you can guess it, was hightailing himself across the channel, and I'm sure uh, the military folks in this audience will sympathise with this, arrived at Montgomery's forward headquarters, and that Montgomery hated was VIP visits. Now, obviously, he couldn't say no to the Prime Minister, but he was a through-and-through -through soldier. His job was to get on with the battle, defeat the Germans, not to host sightseeing tours. But Churchill turned up at his forward headquarters, and with him was a chap called Field Marshal Jan Smuts. I'm sure some of you are familiar with him. He was the South African Prime Minister. He was a close friend of Churchill's and a confidant, and the pair of them had gone over to see how the invasion was going, have a look at the Allied bridgehead, and they were outside Monty's forward headquarters, his caravan, when Smuts suddenly stopped dead and went, I smell Bosch or Germans. Suddenly some guards were rounded up. They rummaged through the local bushes and dragged out a dishevelled looking German soldier. Fortunately he was unarmed. Had he been, Smuts and Churchill would have been dead. You kind of think Churchill might have learned his lesson after that. Oh no. He never forgave the powers that be for not allowing him to take part in the D-Day landings. So come the end of the war, you've got March 1945 and Operation Plunder. Montgomery's huge set-piece battle to get the Allies across the Rhine and into the heart of Nazi Germany. I think you can guess what happened. Churchill, ever the warlord, decided it would be a good idea to take part. So made it known to Monty he wanted to be in an armoured assault vehicle in the second wave crossing the Rhine. Poor old Monty's tearing his hair out, the last thing he wants. So they said, no, he couldn't do that, but what he could do was, with his staff, sit on the west bank of the Rhine and watch the assault. So Churchill and his entourage duly turn up, sat on the banks of the Rhine, and I think you can guess what happened. They couldn't see anything, because, of course, Monty put down an enormous smoke screen to cover the river crossing. So Churchill was a bit cross, so to placate him, they popped him into a landing craft, took him over to the other side of the river. Again, I'm sure the military folks will sympathise with this. Churchill was hosted by General Simpson, commander of the US 9th Army. Poor old Simpson, I'm going to use a British expression here, I'm sure you're familiar with it, had kittens. He did not want the British Prime Minister on his patch in an area that had only just recently been killed, of Germ uh, killed cleared of Germans, and he wanted Monty back on the west bank of the Rhine as quickly as possible. So Monty strode, uh, not Monty, sorry, Churchill, back on the west bank. So they allowed Churchill to wander around for a bit, got him back in the landing craft, and back on the other side of the river. Churchill wasn't very happy about this. So to placate him, they said, we'll take you down to Wiesel to what, look at one of the Rhine bridges, which the Germans had dropped into the river, so Churchill couldn't cross it. They pulled up by this damaged railway bridge. The middle spans were missing because it had been damaged. And again, some of you may have seen the photo. Before they could stop him, Churchill was scrambling up the rubble of that bridge to reach the top uh, and the remaining girders. What's remarkable about that is the photo shows him doing it with a walking stick. And he clambered up onto that bridge. Nobody else did. And of course, you guess what happened? Very quickly, he began to attract German sniper fire and artillery shells began to bracket both sides of the bridge. Now, General Alan Brook, again, some of you may be familiar with him. He was chief of the Imperial General Staff, so he was effectively commander of the British Army. He was there watching proceedings and he was convinced that Churchill had a death wish, that Churchill was determined to die as a fighting warlord in the closing days of the war. And after much pleading, they managed to get him off the bridge. But the purpose of my book really was to examine where did that confidence come from um, and why he felt able to assume the leadership of Britain in May 1940 as Prime Minister and Defence Minister. And that's quite important, I'll come back to that in a minute. What was he seeking to achieve as master and commander, which is the title of the book? And by that I mean political master and military commander. Because I think foremost, Churchill was a politician, but deep down he was also a warlord. But what was he seeking to achieve? Well, Churchill knew from bitter experience in South Africa during the First World War, particularly during Gallipoli, that running wars by committee without decisive leadership 
was a recipe for disaster. Service chiefs need firm direction or strategic objectives become lost. And ultimately, winning the battle is not the same as winning the war. Now, General Spears, who was Britain's liaison officer with France in 1940, he's remarked that Winston Churchill made himself the high priest of a great religion, dedicating itself to a nation of measureless sacrifice. And I think that's what he did. That's what his speeches did. But I've said, not only did he become prime minister, he also become, became the country's very first defence minister. We'd not had one of those before. And the reason that he did that was to assume full control of Britain's war effort. Because by becoming defence minister, it meant the service chiefs answered to him directly and not to the Secretary of State of War as they had traditionally done. And General Eisenhower, Allied Supreme Commander, he observed that during the war, Churchill maintained such a close contact with operations as to make himself a virtual member of the Chiefs of Staff. And of course, that was Churchill's intention. I'm not sure actually whether Eisenhower's observation uh, was a criticism or approval. And Anthony Eden, who was the Foreign Minister during the war, or the Foreign Secretary, he stated the machinery for the military and political conduct of the war had been discerningly built and it worked. And of course the reason it worked was because Churchill had built it. And Eisenhower uh, agreed that Churchill embodied the age-old truth that politics and military activities are never completely separate. But General Brooke, who I mentioned earlier, he recalled that Churchill's ideas Sorry, I'm wandering out of range of the mic, aren't I? Churchill's ideas ranged from the absolute brilliant um, to the downright dangerous. Air Vice Marshal Tedder, who was one of the senior RAF commanders, he noted that Churchill always wanted action no matter the cost, because he was quite an impatient man. But he took those difficult decisions to authorise Dunkirk, which saved the British Army to fight another day. And it was a difficult decision because, of course, the minute we did that, it signaled that we were abandoning France. And the initial planning for operational, Operation Dynamo was kept secret from the French. We didn't let them know until the last minute we were going. Now, to be fair, we did lift 100,000 French troops off those beaches, so honour was served. And likewise, not only did he authorise the evacuation of Dunkirk, he took that very dis difficult decision in May, June 1940 to resist the Luftwaffe. He did not negotiate, which meant he had to fight the Battle of Britain, and as a result of that, the Blitz, which of course witnessed bombing of British cities. And at the same time, of course, shortly after France surrendered, Mussolini joined in on the action, sided with the Axis, attacked France, and of course was then a threat to British from Italian-controlled Libya, a threat to British Egypt. But Churchill took the decision to resist him there as well. And that decision was backed by two crucial strategic factors. He refused to relinquish control of Gibraltar, which I'm sure some of you are familiar, which is a rock off southern Spain, which sits in the mouth of the entrance of the Mediterranean. And likewise, he took the difficult decision not to abandon Malta, which is another British island, or was at the time, which sits right in the middle of the Mediterranean. And indeed, his service chiefs had said that Malta could not be defended, but he refused to abandon it, even after the Royal Navy withdrew its ships to Gibraltar. And as a result of those decisions, it prevented Hitler and Mussolini having full reign in the Med. And the upshot of that is, again, I'm sure some of you are only too familiar, it meant Field Marshal Rommel eventually ran out of men and supplies. And Churchill's Mediterranean first strategy, which he'd agreed with Roosevelt, it worked in North Africa, it worked in Sicily, and it, as a result, triggered the downfall of Mussolini. Uh, where it went wrong, of course, is it didn't work in mainland Italy uh, because we underestimated the speed with which the Germans would react and they occupied northern Italy. Likewise, in 1943, uh, same time as the invasion of mainland Italy, attempts to liberate the Aegean Islands were also a bit of a disaster. And there's no denying that Churchill's direction uh, of the Second World War produced 
mixed results. His successes, as I've just mentioned, Dunkirk, Battle of Britain, uh, the Mediterranean, uh, clearing out Libya and Syria of Vichy French forces, uh, North Africa, Sicily, and of course D-Day itself were all triumphs. His failures kind of number the same amount, actually, they balance each other out. You've got Norway, you've got Greece, Burma, Malaya, Singapore, Tripoli, I mean the list goes on. As I said earlier, only Malta really saved the situation in North Africa. But arguably Norway, I think you can argue, actually um, was a partial success because it crippled the German fleet. Certainly Churchill galvanised the country in its hour of need and provided it with firm leadership. And I think he also rallied the Allies and gave them firm leadership. But it's noticeable, actually, that his style of leadership, it made enemies. Um, Churchill's working practices were not to everyone's like. He famously liked to work late into the night and then get up late. So if you were the Chiefs of Staff, if you were General Brooke, or you were Air Vice Marshal Portal in charge of the RAF, or you were Arthur Harris, who was in command of Bomber Command, if you got an invitation to go down to Chartwell for dinner in the evening, your heart sank. Because you'd get there and there'd be a round of talks about the war, there would be dinner, probably another round of talks, and Churchill loved movies. So Odeon, or one of the film companies, they'd send down rolls of film because Churchill had his own viewing room. They'd all gather, they'd watch a film, come out of the film, maybe have a round of sandwiches, yet more talks, and if you were lucky, you got back to your headquarters about one or two in the morning. So as you can imagine, when there's a global war going on, uh, you've got very early morning briefings, those sorts of punishing schedules were not welcome. In fact, famously, I'm going back to Jan Smuts, the South African Prime Minister. He was the only person that stood up to Churchill because one night when he was at Chartwell, he said, OK, you lot are still staying up. I've had enough. I'm off to bed. And off he went. But as I say, that form of leadership, and it has to be said, Churchill was quite an autocratic war leader, I think. That former leadership, it did make him enemies because I found it rather sad that on May the 8th, 1945, Victory in Europe Day, he and the Chiefs of Staff, they all gathered in Downing Street to have a drink to celebrate the end of the war in Europe. And the service chiefs did not toast his leadership. And I think that's probably because he'd trodden on so many toes over the years. However, I, dis I firmly believe that despite all his military disasters, Churchill rose admirably to the role of master and commander. And I shall let Churchill have the last word of the evening, I think. He claimed, history will be kind to me, for I intend to write it. <laughs> and write it he did. <laughs> I think, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. It's time for me to wrap up. Thank you.